Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I'm here with part three of how to use Geiger counter how to use a Geiger counter. This is where I actually get into how you use one in, in depth. I've shown you some neat stuff, I've shown you a little bit about radiation and told you a little bit about it. Maybe not too much, but a little bit. So you got the, the, these alpha particles that tear through everything like big time and they cut everything to pieces. And you know they're beta particles that are basically just electrons, sometimes positrons. And they tear through a little bit less, but they go a little bit further. And then there are, these th there are these things called gamma rays, which go through everything. And they have a huge amount of energy, but they rarely ever do any damage because they rarely ever hit anything. They just usually fly right through it. Well, this, of course, is a Geiger counter. Here's how you use it. Geiger counters have a tendency to measure radioactivity or detect radioactivity. They are initially calibrated by taking a radioactive object and putting it in front of the Geiger counter at a particular distance. The object is known to put off a certain amount of radiation, be it alpha, beta, or gamma. This one, for example, was calibrated with uh, cesium-137, which is a gamma producer. They put this Geiger counter a few feet away from a, um, a radioactive cesium-137 source, and it bombarded the, ga the Geiger counter with, with cesium-137. Then they adjusted it so that this this little tiny uh, number here equaled exactly what they thought it should equal. Let's say that we had a source. Now, I don't have a source, but let's just pretend that this rock was a source, okay? And we know that it should read about 10 counts per minute. We know it should, let's just say, okay? So we put it at a certain distance, and it's emitting, and then we look at this, and if it doesn't read over a course of a period of time, 10, if it reads something like 20 or, or, or 5 or something, we adjust it so that it does read 10. That's how we are able to calibrate it to know that it's correct. That's how you do it. Now, some Geiger counters, like the old CDV 700s, contain what's called an operational check source. On the side of them, these are the big yellow ones with the, the, with the handle on the top, you know, and the wand. On the side, they have this little tiny circle. On the left side, the little button there, it's actually an operational check source. It's like having a piece of this stuck on the side of it, and you can pull off the wand and hold it up against it to see if it's working. Now, some of them, over time, have lost some of their radioactivity, because some radioactivity dissipates quickly, some doesn't. The ones that have will read in, in, incorrectly, and you have to either account for that or get them fixed. In other words, get a new check source. This is a digital Geiger counter, so of course it doesn't have such a a check source on the side of it. They don't produce them like that anymore. And quite frankly, they don't lose their since their uh, uh, calibration as quickly. The company says for absolute perfection, this should be calibrated once a year. But they also mention, as well as as well as it is very known by most people, that a Geiger counter like this will probably stay reasonably accurate for as much as five years without a single problem. Although I, I do plan to get my calibrated probably every two years, since I'm not using it for anything that requires perfect precision. Okay. Now, next thing to know about Geiger counters is how, is how they work. There's a tube inside of here. It's about the size of a AA battery, or yeah, AA battery. This AA battery-sized tube is full of gas. It has a current going down the, the front of it, and there's a wire down the middle of it. If electricity could go from that casing around the outside and touch the wire on the inside, it would complete a circuit, right? It's like flicking a switch. How's it going to do that? Well, it's full of gas, specifically um, a halogen gas. And when a radioactive particle flies through it, it ionizes it just a little. Being a positive or negative, it adjusts the atoms a little bit and allows po uh, electrical power to seep through. That seeping power completes the circuit, and you get a click. So this happens all the time. In fact, just being out here in, in good old-fashioned nature allows me to pick up radiation. When I point it up towards the air, it's actually probably picking up a little bit more solar radiation than it was before. I went under a tunnel one time under water and it dropped down to an incredibly low one to two counts per minute. So you can tell a lot of cosmic radiation occurs. And the higher you go, the more you get. If you're in Denver, you get 60, 70. If you're on an airplane in the air, you know, you could re get uh, you could get several hundred counts per minute easily, and it's perfectly normal. There's also radioactivity in natural things like this rock, for example. I doubt there's any in it, but there might be a little. Probably not. Eh, maybe a little. Not much. Okay. 
Now, when using a Geiger counter, you need to take into account what unit you're in. This Geiger counter can measure cesium-137 because that's what it was calibrated to. For example, if, if I am in millirankins per hour, that is 0 0.013 millirankins every hour, that's how much I'd be exposed to at this current rate, and I see it's dropping. If I put this near cesium-137 and I looked at this reading, I would know that that is exactly correct because th that is what this was calibrated as. But if I put it near, let's say, cobalt, then I don't know that it's correct anymore. It's going to still tick every time something goes through it, but this number is not quite accurate anymore because all of a sudden it's detecting the radiation, but the levels are different. A very a much higher or much lower energy particle could be going through it. Do, do, do you see what that means? It's like if you are on a, if you if you make a click every single time you see a car go by and you know a car is always 2000 pounds then you know that for every 10 clicks you have 20000 pounds of car go by if a truck goes by the truck is different you aren't calibrated for the truck it still makes the same click but it weighed 50000 pounds so your numbers are off does that make a little bit more sense hopefully it does now there's four units that mine can read in millirankins per hour and that's rankins not row int gens. God, that granite guy always drives me nuts when he says row int gens or whatever the heck he says. Um, basically put, Millerankin is a system that the United States tends to use. It's on most of the old Geiger counters, lots of dosimeters. It's a little m with a capital R divided by hour. Never, ever, 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 ever report or read or whatever reading without saying the unit you're in. Unless you've already beforehand stated that all the re readings you make will be in that unit. Because 0 0.016 millirankins per hour could be massively different than, let's say, 0.6 microsieverts per hour. Well, actually, they are the same, but, well, okay, 1.6 microsieverts per hour, or, or, um, 1.6 sieverts per hour. I mean, that's, that's the, 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 they can be many orders of magnitude different. So just make sure you write down what it is. This there, there, there's sometimes you'll see a little tiny, um, looks, looks kind of like an M, but it's got like a long tail on the front. It's called a mu symbol. That means micro. So make sure you keep that in, uh, in your mind. M means milla. So this is milla Rankins. Generally, anything, anything under 100 counts per minute, which is anything under 0.1 milla Rankin, or anything under one microsievert is relatively safe. Now, you must be the judge of what is and is not safe. Seek a healthcare professional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, talk to a scientist, etc., etc., and all the other disclaimers. But generally speaking, I'll tell you, I find anything under 100 counts per minute to be relatively safe. As you see, I'm still paranoid, but that's just me. Realistically speaking, it's probably safe. So most Geiger counters produce an audible click, like mine does. Some have data entry ports that spit out data for readers. Some of, now, some of them have little buttons and things. Mine has what's called a, a uh, thin mica window. What this is, is it's a small piece of mica, which is very thin, and allows it's thin enough to allow alpha and weak beta particles to get into the Geiger counter. There's, remember how I told you they stop when they hit stuff? They can be so weak that they're not actually able to penetrate through the device itself, and they, they get blocked. But this allows them to allows me to see them. It's called sniffing them. That's the inappropriate term that's used. And it allows me to sniff them. And if I go over here to something that produces them, you'll notice I get a reading. My brick. But if I get close to it without the window, I probably won't get as much of a reading. That's because of the window. Now the brick's not putting off enough to be a really good example, but you get the point. And that's, by the way, where I keep my plate. As you can see, I keep it all bundled up underneath there. Um, next part's coming up in just a minute. I'm going to go over some techniques for how to examine your area and how to write down things. That'll be part four coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, so this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Bye-bye.